Hi, I'm Stuhl Gerian, and welcome to a special video presentation for the IINet Free Zone. Uh, with me is uh, Simon Hackett, one of uh, Australia's internet pioneers. He founded Internode, of course, and is now uh, a board member of IINet. And uh, we have a special mystery guest joining us a little bit later. But of course, today, our very great honour is to have with us uh, a man who probably doesn't need much introduction. He's done many things on the internet, including invent a thing called the World Wide Web. So Timothy Berners-Lee, welcome to Australia for I think the second time, isn't it? Thank you, yes, it's great to be here. To warm up, um, a couple of questions about the past. I noticed with some interest that as a kid you were a train spotter, which is a, a quintessentially English thing to do. But it strikes me that there's some sort of seed to geekery in that, is there? Well, I don't know, I, but I'd point out that the school that I went to the high, for high school uh, was actually stuck between two con, uh, diverging railway lines. You could, and you actually entered the school from the bridge, where, and, that's a, and it was more or less, therefore, you, you were hemmed in. So anywhere you looked on either side, there were these trains going by all day. So I think a lot of kids uh, at that school got in. And I went to school by train as well. And there was still, and when I started going to high school, there was still the odd steam engine. It was, I suppose I, I had model trains as well, and there was a, a bit of a path in that I did. Uh, I spent some time doing the trains, and then I built electronic things to stop the trains at stations and to set the points going the right way so things didn't come off the trails and, and so on. And so those, the, the, the time as the transistor circuitry sort of led into getting into, into electronics in general, maybe, and then after that, I sort of the trains got forgotten and the electronics and the circuits got more complicated. Well, I'm now going to jump ahead a huge number of years. Simon, you've brought in, uh, we have it on the floor here, something a bit special. Would you like to introduce yeah. your special friend? Yes, indeed. This is, this is a, an object that I got out of my computer museum still, um, and it's an object that I might actually get um, Sir Tim to describe, but I, I thought he would find this remarkably familiar in, in the, the, the subject matter that is... Do you know, is now give it a bit of a lift up to get it... Well, I can sort of angle it a little bit, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a big square. Yeah, it's, oh, this yeah, is, this is a personal a computer for 1990. Excuse me, I'll put it down. <laughs> <laughs> this object was, was the computer of the era in, in research institutions like CERN for people like Tim to use to write software. And indeed, he did write some. Yes, this, th th so this was called the Next mm -hmm. box, and it was cool in many, 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 many ways. The, the magnesium, this is solid magnesium with heat Magnesium? Things. This is, mm. it's so a magnesium box. And it still weighs a ton. Yeah. Of, yeah. And, you know, and if you had a smaller piece of it, you could set a light to it and it would make burn <laughs> really, 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 really badly. Optical drives, read-write optical drives, way before their time. That may have been actually what actually brought it down. Inside the Mach um, kernel, and a Unix operating system on a machine designed for normal people to, to use, uh, and a uh, screen, what, a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels, black, an interesting gray screen, grayscale screen, the software on it, basically, way back then, a thing called Nextf, which really is what uh, Steve Jobs took back from Next to, to Apple and became Mac OS X. Tim, I've your enthusiasm shone through as you reached down to, to tell us about this machine. So the years we're talking about at, at CERN, what was, what was your environment like then in which the web was developed? Well, people were, <clears throat> this thing was a workstation, and the, the term workstation now hardly exists. In other words, a, a re reasonably powerful computer with a big screen. And so <clears throat> workstations, uh, so what was great about CERN was there were physicists there trying to solve really hard problems, so people had workstations, and they networked. Now, they networked computers in an, all kinds of ad hoc ways, and there was a certain feeling, there had been a feeling in Europe, that you should use ISO protocols to do your networking, not that funny stuff that the Americans have put together out of a sort of out of wet string over there, which they haven't really standardized properly, but you should use the ISO stack. So at the point, this sort of point when I was looking at building the, uh, the web, in fact, it was just becoming politically possible to use the internet at CERN. And in fact, there were a few renegade, Ben Siegel was a, the sort of renegade guy who, uh, who organized, who clicked to meet the people, explained about the, the, that the internet actually was the best thing to use for this. It was TP4 was the standard one, and TCP was this thing which just kind of worked. And then everybody realized, actually, just kind of works is good. That's all you actually need. Now, the period we're talking about there is uh, 
20 years, more than 20 years ago now. I, I'm thinking of the, the changes that for you have been most striking since that time. I mean, one is the sheer speed of connectivity and the speed of processing power. Uh, another is the, the richness of, of user interfaces that have flourished. We did notice that the load on the first web server, which started off as being that box mm. and then moved on to uh, a, a slightly beefier one, um, it, uh, it went up by a factor of 10 every year when you looked at the logs. And not only that, but if you, it went up over three years by a factor of 10, and if you plotted it on the log scale, you could put a ruler through it. So it was just, so it was absolutely, when people talk, say, oh, it was an exponential increase, you know, they actually mean it really went up a lot. No, this was an exponential in increase in that you would put it on a log graph paper and you put a rule through it. So that, that was clear that it was locked in, there was some mechanism somehow for every person who went, came to our website, a certain proportion of those people then went and either installed a browser or installed a server or both. And, uh, and then, then, then they talked to other people. So it was this, uh, so that was, uh, so we were aware that it was locked into some major growth. Uh, of course, I did call it the World Wide Web, but most of the time we were so worried about it, you know, we, we, it was doing this exponential growth, and then so many things did that. Mm. We were just thinking, okay, what's going to be the thing which trips it up? What, is, you know, is it going to be the IPR? No, getting it, we must get it royalty free. Is it going to be some silly technical mistake? Is it going to be that some other thing, you know, or, or is it that it doesn't, the word doesn't spread fast enough and people end up you know, inventing their own version, which is incompatible? Well, yes. I mean, let's, let's look at that political side, shall we? I mean, the, the internet and the web both evolved from essentially an academic environment. It's now become very much uh, a commercial environment and so much of the world's commerce happens online. Politicians are waking up to the fact that, that information is power and uh, we're re-plumbing those power lines across the planet and therefore people want to preserve old ways of doing things, they want to lock things down. What, what are your observations on, on that? Over the last 20 years in general, the concern, the one concern you could summarise as somebody taking control of the internet. Mm. And that somebody, depending on where you look over the last 20 years some, and where you are on the planet, your concern may be that a government t takes it, maybe yours, maybe somebody else's, or it could be that your com the company does. So some people w are, are concerned that the you know, that ISP will just decide, ha, huh, you know, this is pretty cool. We can, uh, hey, you know, if we really, if we, you know, if we spy on our users, we can find out so much information about them. Well, that's, that's the business model of so many internet companies now, not the internet service providers who provide the pipes, but uh, trading in private information and uh, understanding your users, that's, that's the currency almost right, now but of that the startup. Let's make that, you say not the ISP that, that provide the pipes. To me, that is crucial. So when I get, go to an ISP, and what I want is a pipe. I want bits going one way and the other, and that's just what I want. I want to pay a reasonable market right for value for the bits at that speed. And I don't want the, no, I don't want the ISP then you know, deciding what I should buy, deciding which websites I should go to. Uh, so now, when I go to a website and I buy some shoes or something, or I buy Christmas presents for all my for all my friends and relations, then actually I'm it, it, I'm pretty happy. To a certain extent, with that website remembering about the things that I bought, so the next time I go back, they'll say, hey, you know, well, this time, Welcome when you were here last time, yes, yeah. this was, you left this in your shopping basket. So, in fact, uh, in general, it's very valuable for, for websites that I do business with to keep information about me, just as I keep information about them. And we've got a, we have a thing going there, and we have us on an account, I owe them money, they owe me goods, and so on. So that sort of thing, I think, is... So with lots of things, in fact, it's very reasonable that people keep information. There's a, yes, there's, there is a concern that if you, uh, if you spend all your time on one website or everything goes through one web website or if people use cookies very cleverly that they can maybe correlate what you're doing on one website with what you're doing on all the other websites. Um, so, the, so I know a lot of people have concerns uh, uh, in that area. But I think that's of a different level. To, have, you know, the, the, uh, to concerns about the, IEP, uh, the ISP spying on what you're doing. Yeah, I would, I, and the point about that I'd, I'd give you as, a, as an ISP is that rather like everyone else in the industry, we're actually too busy to want to spy on our customers. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have the motivation to do it for the, exactly the same reasons you've indicated. And the challenge, of course, happens when our governments decide to force us to.
Mm -hmm. And when governments pass a law to actually drive that behaviour, then we're a law-abiding company and we have to follow it. Beyond, you know, other than that, yeah, our motivation is the same as our customers, just to move the bits really fast. That's it. That's, well, when that attitude is great because it means that you're, you're really uh, working in that up market to supply the best product and you're not trying to, uh, you're, you're not trying to muddle in, uh, by connecting up with another market. So that means that the market for shoes is also optimised in, in that I can, it, it means that it's cheap for me to get to a shoe store. I can get to any shoe store I want. So that as, as a result, I can go and uh, sort of, uh, the, it's an efficient market and I can, uh, at that level, and a, separate, and, I, and a separate efficient market for the bits. And keeping those separate, I think, is, yeah, obviously works. Has been working well for a long time. Now, Simon, we've got some uh, questions that have come in from IONET customers. Uh, the first one is actually is about this thing called the semantic web. So maybe you need to introduce that question in our, our next topic. Joel Heenan has asked a question about the semantic web. And his question is, how can we make the semantic web happen this year? And what role do you see for search engines and SEO in that universe? And it may be perhaps more rational to start out with getting you to explain what the semantic web is. To people coming to the semantic web, they sort of thought, Oh, the semantic web, that's all about description logic, the web ontology language, it looks complicated to me. In fact, we realised later the message that they'd missed was, no, this is all about your data. This is about data interoperability. This is actually about data integration. And data integration is something that enterprise, you know, enterprise software has been hammering on for ages. So the question is, how can we make that happen, well, this year, faster anyway, I suppose? How can we work towards this goal? So one of the things which you can do is connect onto the open government data push. There's a lot of data being put out there by governments. There's a five-star system that I've used for, for, for you know, deciding what I think about data on the web. And so the first, the first star is you've got data on the web with an open license, so it's reusable, even if it's actually a photograph of a scan of a fax of a document, you know, which so has to be rekeyed. That's one, you get one star for that, because you get a big star because it's difficult to put the data on the access. Cause it, yeah, cause if we, every, so you've done the political difficult bit. Two stars, if it's machine readable, whew, I don't have to rekey it. Uh, it's in Microsoft, what, hang on, well, Microsoft Excel or something. Well, okay, two stars if it's in Microsoft Excel because that's a proprietary format. Three stars if it's in a non-proprietary format. So like a comma set separated values file. Uh, lots of people know how to handle that, like, uh, like JSON. Like, uh, and the thing which is not proprietary is machine readable. You get three stars. Four stars if you've converted it into something like Turtle. Turtle is a semantic web language. That means you give URLs, your eyes to all of the concepts. That means that when you put it on the, if you put it out there in Turtle, I can link to it. So even though you've put your database out there without worrying about linking, because you put it in the right format and because you've given URLs to each of your columns, I can say, oh, when he says, his column that says zip code, it's what the same thing as I mean by postcode. And then machines can start to actually just answer queries on my system by using data on your system. So you get four stars for using, making it linkable data you, by putting it out there using the RDF, uh, one of the RDF formats. And I'd recommend Turtle, for example. Uh, and then your fifth star you get if you actually do some linking. The question was, what should you do? Well, go out, look, find some good three-star data and work on putting it out there in four-star. Or put your own data out there for your, your own, company, yes. your business, or whatever, and build build cool tools that go, that use this data, and uh, and use the fact that use the fact that it's linked data. In other words, that not don't just load a table as though it's just a table, but use the fact that all the identity each row is uh, has got a URL, and a lot of the values have got URLs. And when you look them up, you get more data. That is what needs to, you know when it's linked data, it's linked data, just like uh, hypertext is linked text. Well, uh, time now to uh, introduce our special mystery guest who's magically appeared uh, on your screen right. Uh, Mr. Robert Llewellyn, welcome. Thank you. Now, I suspect most people are not going to recognise you in your current uh, incarnation here on stage, so perhaps you would like to do a quick impression of how people are, are more likely to remember you. It's, it's very difficult without three and a half pounds of prosthetic rubber, but uh, essentially uh, I play a mechanoid a very advanced computer, uh, built 3,000 years in the future, uh, in a comedy BBC series called Red Dwarf. 
which so, has um, become a bit of a cult classic. It's become a bit of a cult classic over the last 24 years. Almost, y- it's yes, almost as old as, as the internet. <laughs> as has your character's sarcasm yes. in, that, in, in that series. But of course, uh, you are a, a writer as well more recently yes. and your most recent uh, novel news from gardenia is what that one of those rare things a book about a future britain which is not some dystopian hell yes there's no zombies <laughs> not even one not even one how zombie how do you expect to sell a book without <laughs> zombies in it i, it does, I have I been know. criticized you could uh, people said could you put some zombies in there yes you know, just... that book is set in the future how far in the future and how did you envisage computers yeah in 200, that? 200 years in the future 2211 uh, which the hero originally thinks is the time when he arrives there, um, but it's actually the date. Uh, it's, um, it, it, I mean, it's compl- I sort of saw it as completely part of, it's integrated completely, so people don't think of it as a net or a network or a, or a, a form of communication, so they call a thing a book, because that's the traditional term for it, and they also, they still make paper books as a sort of, as, as works of art, but they also mm. call a thing, which is just a sheet, a book and then uh, the, the hero has to learn how to use the book which is completely intuitive i mean it just comes on because you want to see a recipe and there's a recipe on there for this you know it just happens it just happens it just happens okay yes. and, it, and there's no there's no wires or there's no wires anywhere so i've, I've sort of envisaged it sort of an inductive charging world so that there's no batteries no wires there's just power and there's just information so it's like a piece of paper that is whatever you need it to be. Yes, yes, it becomes whatever you need well, it to well, be. Well, Simon, yeah. I know you've had some thoughts about th- perhaps the nearer future of our yeah. computer interfaces. Yeah, indeed, still. Um, and the, the notion that Robert's indicated of, of almost like an iPad, but you can fold it and put it in your pocket is one view of the world, but it's, it's still a two-dimensional view of the world. And certainly in my youth, I, I enjoyed reading novels like Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which envisages that kind of classic science fiction theme of a three-dimensional metaverse where we all goggle into it and we're seeing instead a three-dimensional part of the world or a three-dimensional representation of that information rather than a 2D one. So, um, so Tim, it's actually one of the questions I've got for you, which is do you see, what do you see after the current web? Is it, does it, do we go into a three-dimensional version of this or do we, or do we go somewhere else? Where do you think? Well, it's interesting that I kind of expected the 3D to take off much earlier. Mm. In the very first web conference, Dave Raggett organized a virtual reality markup language, uh, BOF, and Mark Pesci was there, and he actually worked on uh, VRML. Mm. And we thought, you know, everybody thought, yeah, you know, this 2D thing, that is gonna be, uh, that is gonna be so yesterday. And every, every, it's gonna be so, uh, so we imagined the, your desktop being th- 3D, and so that you move things you know, in perspective and put them on shelves and you'd have much more space <laughs> after all because you could move them to the back and, uh, and things. So, and, more and, dimensions, and, the better. And, yeah. and but that, that was so early. Was, was it, was it but, bandwidth? Was it computing power? I mean, I think it was partly I think, uh, computing power. I think from asking the experts now, they seem to think it's uh, maybe a bit of bandwidth. But obviously, to a certain extent, if you've got a desktop which has got things, the amount of... Um, data you need to actually represent where things are, like in a game, to actually represent the state of the game, you don't really need very much. If you've got a strong, if you've got a big computer which can generate all the textures and everything and create your 3D world, then actually you don't need a very high bandwidth. Those 3D interfaces and then things like, you know, gesture and control, surely as the technology and computer power becomes available, won't it just all adapt to how we as humans communicate normally, which is how you and I are communicating now. We're talking to each other, we're looking at each other, we're smiling, we're nodding, we're frowning when we're confused. Yes, and if, if we were to do it uh, with a, uh, over a chunk of net, uh, here represented by our, uh, somebody who provides a net, so then we have a screen, and, you know, I, I'd be looking at a screen, you'd be looking at a screen, and after a while that'll be, that'll be a stereoscopic screen maybe, and after a while the, the, the cameras, the stereoscopic cameras, so, that, so things will get a little bit more, more realistic. The rise of pixels is something I've been putting in talks for a long time. Noticing that the, 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 the cost of pixels has been going down. Mm, and uh, we just want more of them. You know, and, the and, and then and sort of I w- would joke that actually, you know, instead of having uh, the, the walls with these shapes on them, that, that people would actually have just have pixels there and decide and just dial up in the morning what sort of shapes you want on the walls. But that is starting to happen. And now as you go into more and more rooms, you're going to have actually sort of floor to ceiling pixels. So it might be interesting when you get to the point where practically you can cover the entire room with pixels. 
and then do you have a, you know, and if you find a way of doing that, that so that you can so that when we sit down here everything else we see is actually being controlled by the computer and it gets to the point you know the sort of what the sort of like Apple called the retina point where the pixels are so are sufficiently fine that it doesn't matter how big they are because you can't see them anyway. That is a, a fascinating point. Gentlemen, time has defeated us, but the, the world covered in pixels that you cannot see is, is an intriguing one for me. So we, we will have to end it there. So Tim, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. And also Robert Llewellyn, thank you. Simon Hackett. I'm still Gary and thanks for joining us.